but it's it's great that uh, that she's being given that award. I don't think we have anything to do with it, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, a couple of other items. There's something called the Housing Navigator, which we have discussed in the past, and it's now live. It was a collaboration, I think, between Mass Housing Partnership, um, DHCD, and the Kuhn, Found Kuhn Foundation. And it's been in process for at least two, maybe three years. And apparently they've just gone live and they do have uh, list units for rent in this area as well as elsewhere in the state. So that should be a big help to people who are searching for affordable housing because it's not just any rental units, it's restricted to affordable units that are available. And uh, I think I sent people, some people a notice about it. Um, if you wanna know more, you can either contact me or put the housing navigator into your Google search and it should show right up. Uh, this isn't Amherst, but it's close enough. The Pelham Zoning Board of Appeals last night unanimously approved a home city proposal to develop 34 affordable units in town. And for people who may not recall or may not know, Home City is led by Tom Kegelman, who is a former member of the Housing Trust and is actually attending this meeting. So congratulations to Tom and his staff on having that new development approved. They still obviously have plenty of work to do, but getting by the Pelham Zoning Board of Appeals is an important milestone as we all know. And uh, I think that's it for announcements that I have. Does that anybody have anything they wanna add? By the way, if any of the attendees have a point at which they wanna enter the meeting, just raise your hand and Nate or I will uh, uh, put you on in, into the panel. I wanna, um, I, let me just mention who's, who's attending. Uh, okay. We have a new UMass undergraduate, Ethan Salveson, who uh, Pamela Schwartz referred to us. Uh, Kevin Noonan is in, um, which I didn't expect. I thought Kevin was going to be out of town. Linda Slakey of the Amherst Community Land Trust. Uh, Mary Beth Agulowitz who is still the director of the Senior Center for another day or so, um, and she'll be joining us. And Maura Keen is on, who I have to mention, I appreciate uh, all the coverage that she's given us uh, in uh, blocking on the name of the pu publication. Amherst Indy. Amherst Indy, thank you, Pat. Okay, great. And Anna Devlin Gautier, has also joined us. So we have a good group of people. Uh, and I guess we should start off. The first thing to start off with is minutes. And I sent people minutes. Oh, wait a second. I said I would do introductions of the uh, other folks who are on. And I didn't do that. So I'm John Hornick. I'm the chair of the Housing Trust. Uh, Nate Malloy. Sure. Hi, I'm Nate. Johnny, you also mentioned that state rep Mindy Dom is here. I mean, uh, and then also Tom uh, Kegelman's here. Right. So yeah. hi, everyone. I'm Nate, a planner with the town, and I help uh, staff the trust. Uh, Carol? Uh, I'm Carol Lewis. I'm a member of the trust. You certainly are. <laughs> Rob? I'm Rob Crowder. I'm a member of the trust. I'm also a member of the Harris Community Land Trust. Allegra. Hi, I'm Allegra Clark. I'm also a member of the trust. Great. Will. I am Will Van Evelyn, also a member of the trust. And Erica has just joined us. Erica Piedad. Sorry, I had lots of technical difficulties, and I'm also a member of the trust. 
You can okay. blame it on the weather, Erica. It's fine. Right. <laughs> our, our town council liaison, Pat. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Rita. Rita Farrell, I'm a consultant to the trust. Okay. So that's our group so far. Possibly Sid will join us um, and possibly Francis will join us. We'll see. Um, okay, so the first order of business is I sent out, I think, four different copies of minutes from four past meetings, July, two in June, and one in May. I got a note from Carol about some minor corrections, which I don't think we need to go over, uh, from, I think it was the May minutes, and also the suggestion, which I think I'll try to follow through with, to add the letter that Allegra had asked us to endorse uh, regarding uh, is it evictions or, uh, no, reg sorry, regarding, uh, tell me again, Allegra, sorry, I'm losing The it. Community Safety Working Group's recommendations. Okay. Thank you. The heat's gotten to me. Okay, are there any other comments or Suggestions for changes in those minutes? Okay, then uh, following what we've done in the past, I'm gonna assume that they're accepted uh, with the exception of the few changes that Pat asked that we make and they will eventually appear on, uh, 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 on the town website. Okay, Anna Devlin has asked to talk, so I will allow her to talk. Um, sorry, I, I don't think I did. If I raised my hand, it was by accident, but hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, so sorry, moving on to the next item on the agenda. Minutes, moving along. Uh, Okay, the next item on our agenda, I'm gonna call on Mary Beth uh, to talk about planning for the future of the seasonal shelter. Uh, and we can talk a bit about this. I'll also ask Kevin to join us, Kevin Noonan, to uh, brief us a little bit on what's happened with the actual seasonal shelter in uh, the past uh, season. So Mary Beth, why don't you start and then Kevin can join us too. Great, well, welcome. And thank you, thank you for inviting me, Pat. I am still here and I'm working to the very end. And uh, I, you know- I'm very I mean, glad you're still here. <laughs> I mean, I have a, a title uh, and a little crown to be wearing in the senior center. I intend to stay involved and particularly around these issues because I think it matters so very much. So I'm really thrilled to be with you all. And you know, I also would would uh, sort of call out that Allegra sits on the group um, that we have uh, been charged, which is the Homelessness and Rehousing Working Group. And so, if she has any comments or reflections that she'd like to add, uh, besides Kevin and myself, to please join in. But where we are right now, uh, that particular group, the uh, Homelessness and Rehousing Working Group, had essentially two tasks as a charge, one that was short-term and then one that was long-term. The short-term was to come up with a seasonal shelter plan and the long-term was really looking at uh, housing and rehousing within the town of Amherst and looking at, is there any way in which we can reimagine or reinvent what we do already or leverage uh, the resources that we have in a way that might be more service oriented or uh, more successful. So um, my, our remarks tonight are really focused just on that first piece, which is the, um, the seasonal shelter plan. And um, Allegra, Kevin and myself and other members of the group have been looking at a variety of options. We began with a review of town properties that were available. So one of the important pieces of the charge for the group was to uh, obtain a town inventory of potential sites and then review them. So we're looking at them for the short term and the long term. 
in review for the short term, we didn't find that find that any were suitable for the fall. Um, so we, we've sort of put, set them aside for now and, and we'll be looking at them again for a long term plan and uh, what would be necessary. So then we began to look at uh, religious spaces because of course that's a, a spot that Kevin uh, and Craig's doors have um, certainly occupied within the community with, with different religious organizations. And so at this point in time, uh, we are engaged in really promising conversations and um, negotiations with one group here in the town of Amherst, which it really does look very hopeful. Um, Kevin has done all of the groundwork um, and um, we had another meeting where the town was represented with uh, Dave and Rob Mora as the building inspector to sort of walk through that space and check out its suitability and um, sort of like a guesstimate of modifications that would be necessary and, and how that might work. And so the, there's an architect who will be meeting uh, up again with the building inspector and looking at a, a, a more intensive plan. And um, so, so far the leadership of uh, this particular organization, which I'm gonna still at this point keep uh, unidentified uh, because there's a process that really needs to be respectful um, around uh, the, the congregation and the worship community and making sure that this is something that they are part and parcel of. And I'm sure Kevin can, can talk about that. And even what we did last year with the UU community about holding um, space and conversation with the entire congregation at eventually. So um, it is hopeful. Um, it looks to be an appropriate space. There seems to be some really firm um, commitment, both um, sort of as a, as, as a spiritual endeavor and also that it is a really uh, good alignment of their mission and their work in the world and um, what the shelter represents and, and the kind of work that they do in the world. And we are, we're waiting to hear more about that process once we get some more details and it goes to further um, conversation with a larger congregation piece. The one thing that I would, I would note from this is it would be um, an overnight shelter. So the capacity is not yet determined, you know, maybe perhaps somewhere, I think uh, Kevin and um, uh, Rob Moore were talking about somewhere in the realm of like 14 to 20. So what, what we're looking at in terms of full capacity is we still have the 20 rooms at the University Motor Lodge, which those will continue through this shelter season. And then this would be an additional potential 14 to 20 in a congregate setting that is an overnight um, shelter venue. And so what sort of like a walk and mole when we solve one problem, we still have a few more to pick up. And so with the overnight shelter, of course, that leaves that question of a day warming site and also shelters, I mean, showers. So uh, those are pieces that we haven't yet, I think really dived into or dove into. Um, we've spoken with um, Amherst Survival Center in terms of their capacity for that this year. Uh, with COVID being unknown, what is known is, is at this time, they are hopeful that they will be able to open for a short period of time from 12 to three. And that, that space that might be available will not be that large space that many of us are familiar with because that's still being used for packing food, but it would be the former store area. So that would be a smaller space, um, but it would be available you know, in the afternoon. The showers remain available, but you know, there's also uh, a grant which has been made available to Craig's Doors for modification of their resource center trailer to create an ADA shower but also I think there's a, there's a conversation that needs to be had around a, a shower trailer so that it is more widely accessible and one that is ADA compliant. Um, so I know that those are gonna be pieces that will be unfolding. And so, so that's, I, I'd add that. And if, if Kevin or Allegra uh, wanna add more to that. Sure, I don't know if I'm unmuted or not. Yeah, we can hear you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And sorry, John, I did tell you I wouldn't be able to come because I'm in Germany, actually. So <laughs> but we we, uh, we got in very early this morning and then spent most of the day sleeping. So I'm still on your schedule in terms of my uh, circadian rhythms. But, well, thanks uh, for joining us, Kevin. But it's 1.20 uh, in the morning here. So I don't know if I'll stay for the whole meeting. 
But uh, thank you, Mary Beth, for that excellent report. And I'm so sorry that she is leaving because she was a really a wonderful person to work with and got a lot done with her. We got a lot done with her this year. And uh, I will be very sad to see her go. Um, anyway, uh, we did close the congregate shelter at the UU on the 31st of July. As Mary and Beth said, we're making very good progress on an alternate site. I think the only concern I have is that if that site doesn't come through, we don't really have plan B. Uh, so I'm not sure what plan B would be. There aren't that many congregations that are willing to, because everyone's thinking right now about joining, rejoining or reconvening their congregations in their spaces. And when that happens, the space that's left over for uh, this type of activity uh, is, is thinner or smaller. So, but we're optimistic, we're, we're optimistic. And uh, uh, we still have the University Lodge where we have 20 rooms and because uh, people are vaccinated, we've been able to double up those who are vaccinated except in one case where one individual has sort of waived that concern. So we have 29 guests there. And uh, someone asked a question uh, as to how many guests we had over 65 and there were seven apparently that we had. I thought Jerry was gonna, Jerry Weiss was gonna be here tonight, but no. Uh, anyway, um, so we are, I know you, you had it on your agenda too, to talk about how can we figure out how to purchase this motel. Uh, one of the problems is that it's in the gateway of UMass. So the purchase price would be a little bit steep because of this potential resale value if the zoning were to change which I think perhaps the owner is optimistic about more so than, uh, than I am, but maybe, maybe I'm just misguided about that. Um, in any case, what we're doing right now, it, it de facto is sort of transitional supportive housing. And we would like to turn that into permanent supportive housing. And one of the things that's been, a, I'm happy to report is that no one in the neighborhood has raised any concerns about the population living there. Uh, we've been there since November. We knocked on all the doors and no one has raised any. In fact, some of the neighbors actually volunteered to help out in whatever way they could at, the, at Christmas. So um, yeah, that's, it's been a very, very positive thing. I think we've proven that we can do this and, and not disrupt a community. Uh, we're sort of doing it the, backwards from the way it was done at 132 North Hampton Road. Not, and the way they did it at North Hampton Road is the correct way to do it. But uh, that ran into a buzzsaw. So, uh, but that's been approved and congratulations to everyone who supported that. And congratulations to Valley Community Development uh, Corporation for getting it done. So I don't have anything else. And, uh, but unless anyone has any question, uh, I'll, I'll stop talking. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, so basically where things stand, you didn't say this, but I think you had the most active shelter season in the history of Craig's Doors uh, in this last year. You served many more people, both in Amherst and also at a separate motel site in Hadley. So congratulations on expanding your program and serving a lot more people in a time when that was even more critical than it has been in the past. Thank, thank you. We we did almost serve sixty people at one point at the you know as of February sixteenth we were able to open up at the at the Hadley um, Econo Lodge and we were able to keep that open through June seventeenth. So we did have sixty people that we were serving. Um, there are some efforts to try and look at the possibility of purchasing that motel. That's kind of beyond our reach, but. Uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully that, you know, Pamela Schwartz is involved in convening not only Wayfinders, but Home City Housing, sorry, not Home City Housing, uh, Valley CDC, Valley. Mm -hmm. to, to see if there are some possibilities about uh, acquiring that property and converting that into a mixed use. Uh, the problem always occurs when, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be able to put the development package together, and it's another one to sustain it over 20, 21 years with supportive services and case management. How do you how do you nail that down? Where do you get the money? But Mindy's on the call, so maybe she can help us with that piece. Um, but thank you for that, uh, John. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, well, John, you... can I can I just add one thing? Because I, I think one of the, the most important findings of the last year is not just the uh, capacity that Kevin was able to uh, shelter people, but really was the incredible success of using this model of the hotels. And I think it, it's such amazing proof and, and should really uh, inspire our community to pursue those kinds of options uh, rather than large congregate settings. Because what he demonstrated over and over again is that when you give somebody personal agency and autonomy and dignity through affording them a singular home with a door and their own room and privacy, of how successful those individuals can be living in community. And I think, you know, Kevin briefly mentioned that no neighbors were upset or, you know, there, there weren't issues, but, but I think you can't really underscore that enough about how that form of housing helps to stabilize an individual and bring them along the continuum in terms of readiness for rehousing or more, as he suggests, permanent supportive housing. So I, I think that um, one of the big learnings from this last year I, I think nationwide and certainly within the Commonwealth is that the use of the hotels really is a preferential model and is one that uh, is far more successful for individuals who even uh, through uh, congregate settings might have been unsuccessful, they can be successful. Uh, and, and we can do greater work with them to move them along in terms of, of achieving their own goals for whatever stability and wellness means for them. And, and Kevin and his staff did an amazing job for that. And, and I just think um, it was an experiment and few communities dove in like Kevin did right from the get-go in terms of, of going after that hotel model. And it was extremely successful for the occupants and the guests, so. Yeah, even though it's temporary, it's consistent with the housing first model which has mm -hmm. been very successful now for over 30 years in housing individuals who are formerly homeless. Okay, are there other questions or comments that folks on the Housing Trust have for Mary Beth or Kevin? Allegra, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I mean, I think they covered it all and I think that they've really been leading the charge and. I think they have the support of the rest of the working group and their work, but they've been really on the ground folks, as far as I'm concerned. I guess I have, I have one question in terms of, you know, there's finding a site and then there's operational, um, you know, funding. And how does that look you know, in terms of, you know, next year and for the next few years? I, that is a good question, Nate. Um, when we ran the, uh, the motel in Hadley and, and in Amherst, we were able to get 100% reimbursement from FEMA. But with the governor re, uh, removing the state of emergency, we can no longer bill FEMA for the cost of those motels, even though FEMA had extended through September 30th, which is the end of the federal fiscal year. Uh, so it's to us, it's very frustrating to see money being left on the table. We are able to continue the emergency, um, the um, University Motor Lodge, because of uh, ESG CV funding, which you're familiar with. And um, that's good until June of 2022. But our fear is that we'll go back to the, uh, the state budget, the O2 line item, which is very, very good that we have it. And thank you, Mindy and, and others, for making sure that get, that got preserved this year. But it's only it's barely adequate to run an overnight shelter. It's certainly not adequate to run a 24-hour shelter. Not that we have a space in mind for a 24-hour shelter at this point, but um, it's going to be difficult um, as as the COVID. Well, hopefully this Delta variant will not be long live. But uh, as COVID recedes, um, I think we're going to go back to status quo in terms of available resources. Uh, for people who are homeless, and that's a sad thing, especially since, as Mary Beth said, not just us, but across the country, it's been proven the hotel model is, which gives agency and, and a door, which is why we named our agency Craig Stewart. Um, it, it, it's it's the model we should strive for. Did, did you say something else? I can't hear you all of a sudden. No, I, no, that wasn't me. I didn't... Oh, sorry. No, I, I did hear some static too, but that wasn't, it wasn't me. Okay. 
but hopefully that answered your question. We're, no, not, yeah, thanks, we're, not, we're not 100% sure how it's going to play out, but every year we would work with the O2 budget, which is the last two digits of that line item, and that's for single uh, people who are homeless. And by March, we would be out of money and we'd have to rely on donated funds. So mm -hmm. we probably will be heading back in that direction. Although with the Biden administration, the ARPA funds, maybe maybe there could be some funds av available to purchase a place like the, uh, the University Motor Lodge. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you both participating and giving us these reports, which are certainly valuable for us. Um, I guess that means we move on to the next item. I was actually gonna skip down to legislative advocacy because Mindy is on the call and she might wanna join us for this. Um, one of the things that Will and I were aware of is that uh, we got a, a notice from Pamela Schwartz about uh, eviction prevention legislation that is pending in the legislature in fact, there was a three or four hour hearing on it today and people are looking for as many groups around the state as possible to chime in in support of uh, this legislation. So um, and Mindy, is there something that you wanna say about this? I guess we have to put her on the panel. Sure, I'll let, I'll, uh, you're being promoted to panelist, Mindy, if you're, if you're there. Might yes. Take, yeah, it might take a second. Hi. I assume everybody knows Mindy Dom. Hi, everybody. <laughs> wonderful state representative. I'm sitting here just listening in my uh, family room, so forgive me for just hanging out on my couch. Um, so I guess I just wanna make sure everyone knows that in the FY22 budget, um, one of the things that the uh, House and the Senate did was we included a lot more money for raft in there, specifically because when the governor lifted um, the eviction moratorium in Massachusetts, there was this provision that said that if you had an application and process for raft, that eviction notices um, and uh, notices to quit would be paused. At that time, he hadn't yet put in a lot of money for raft and assistance. So the legislature stepped in and put money into it. And then for FY22, we increased it. The bill that was being discussed today was also around sort of preventing evictions moving forward. I don't know how fast that bill is going to move. I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure if, and I don't know why it was scheduled for August, if that was because the federal eviction moratorium was just lifted and so the committee wanted to deal with it very quickly, or if it was because they didn't get to do it by July 31st and they just wanted to make sure they had it under their belts. I'm not sure. Um, but either way, it's great that they had it because now we can kind of press them to advance the bill from the committee and move it to House Ways and Means. I wanna point out that there's another piece of legislation that has not yet had a hearing this session, but will in the fall that I hope people will um, sort of think about and try to get involved with. And that's the bill that creates a legal right to counsel in housing and eviction cases. I see Erica nodding her head. Hi, Erica. Um, it's, this is one of the most important things that we can do to prevent um, evictions is make sure that people who are facing an eviction notice have legal counsel. Right now, they do not have the right to have that. Um, when I went, when I first got elected, I went to the housing court in Hadley and I just sat in on a housing court that morning. And I learned that for the most part, the housing court judges actually end up doing like legal counsel for both landlords and tenants during legal proceedings, sort of making sure that people know what their rights are, understanding the law. That takes up a lot of time and prevents people from actually having an adequate hearing. So this particular bill, and I'm happy to get you more information on this, John, if you want. Um, it, it was introduced for a couple of sessions already. Um, the main filers are representatives Dave Rogers, who I think is from Belmont, and Rep. Michael Day, who's from Stoughton, who's also the chair of the Judiciary Committee. And this is a great bill, and it's one that we really need to get passed. In terms of um, 
eviction protections, there's several kind of avenues that we have to sort of do a full core press on. One is making sure that people have rental assistance and funds so that they can avoid eviction. The second one is making sure they have counsel in case they get a notice of eviction. Um, and the third one is we have to, un we have to um, make sure that eviction sort of histories are sealed and that they don't follow people for their whole lives. This is another piece of legislation that's in the house that would seal eviction no, um, legal proceedings so that if somebody had an eviction when they were in their 20s or they were a child and their parents had an eviction um, notice, it won't haunt them for their whole life and prevent them from accessing um, housing in the future. Um, those two bills, the one that's about right to counsel and sealing evictions, um, they'll both get hearings in the fall. I'm happy to share that information with you when it comes down the pike. And in terms of today's hearing, John, I sent you the, um, which you may have already received from Pamela, um, a letter that pretty much the entire Western Mass delegation, um, senators and representatives co-signed to the committee, the, the Joint Committee on Housing today in favor of that bill and urging a favorable um, advancement. So that was co-signed by myself, as well as representatives from Berkshire, Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties, and state senators, including um, Senator Comerford. I think I've spoken enough. <laughs> That's great. I'll just add one other thing. I think this is in the bill. Uh, Tom Kegelman, some years ago now, pointed out to me the importance of legal counsel for small landlords. Yes. Um, that, because they typically the don't have it. And that's in the bill. And that's yeah. also important. And that was actually a compromise in the bill, I think, last session that the filers put in to, to help move the bill. Like they learned that um, small landlords face this, but they also heard that without landlord support, it probably wasn't going to go anywhere. And so they really wanted to try to make that bill so that both small landlords and tenants could access legal counsel. It's also a way, as I said, to relieve the pressure on the housing court judges who get pulled into making sure that whether you're a tenant or a landlord, you understand your rights when it's really, you should have a lawyer be doing that. And the judge should be doing the judicial piece, not the legal counsel piece. Okay, thanks, Mindy. That's really helpful. Thanks, John. Thank you for um, the opportunity to talk. Will, Thank is you there everybody any... for your service. <laughs> Thanks. Will, is there uh, anything you want to add about the particular bill that we should ask people if they're willing to support? Um, I don't think so. I mean, that was a pretty comprehensive summary. I felt, I mean, the housing equity bill, which the hearing, uh, which we're hearing on today, uh, which, you know, seems pretty straightforward. Uh, I assume that most members of the trust are, or maybe that's something we should, we should vote on is whether or not we want to go ahead and endorse that officially uh, and sign on to the letter that Pamela was circulating. Um, and then otherwise, the, the, I think it's called the Homes Act, the, uh, the Eviction Record Sealing um, Act, which Mindy already spoke about was something I was hoping to bring up, but she already spoke to that. Yeah, I think we may have voted on that earlier uh, in, in the past. Is that right? Uh, but not, obviously not this year where it's been reintroduced. Hmm. Well, let's focus on the uh, aid, uh, Act to Prevent COVID-19 Evictions and Foreclosures. Um, I move that we uh, send a letter in support and that we also join the statewide group uh, in support of this bill. So is there a second? I second. second. And are there questions or comments before we look to vote? I don't know if this is entirely related, but um... In terms of the CDC morator or moratorium that's been extended to October, it was my understanding that when it was issued, Hampshire and Franklin were the only two counties in Massachusetts that did not qualify um, because they did not, they weren't in the highest risk levels. And I just wasn't sure if, since these numbers are a moving target, if we eventually slide into it or not. I saw the same thing, Allegra. So I think you're correct that we are not uh, under the umbrella of the CDC moratorium extension. And I believe the rationale is there were court decisions 
against the first moratorium because it was too blanket. And so the CDC said, okay, we're going to be selective and only identify the counties around the country that are actually in crisis. And as you point out, I think correctly, Hampshire and Franklin were excluded. I know, I don't know about the rest of the state, but I know that Berkshire and Hamden counties are both included. So that makes this uh, piece of legislation that we've just been discussing probably even more important. Okay, are we ready to come to a vote? Okay, I'm assuming we are. Um, Erica, yay or nay? Yay. Will? Yay. Allegra? Yay. Rob? Yes. Uh, Carol? Yes. And I'm in favor as well. Okay, so that's... Looks like six to zero with three people absent. Okay, thanks very much. And thank you, Mindy, for uh, going through the legislation that's before us, as well as legislation that will come before us um, in the next few months. Okay, moving along, I'll go back to in our order. Um, and uh, the next thing was the E Street Belchertown Road RFP. And I'm particularly curious now that you mentioned earlier, Nate, that Anthony Delaney is leaving the town of Amherst service. Yeah, the um, I, I still think it's all set. I, I spoke with him the other day and um, he said he was gonna try to get it ready so it'd be um, um, out next Wednesday or Thursday. So, um, you know, that was Tuesday. So he said that was, you know, it's, I think it's, I will thank the trust again, you know, I think it was a good job. There are a few questions in the end. Um, staff, John, Rita, and myself uh, had some questions about the site visit in terms of how to structure it, just to have it be accommodating to developers. And so there's a, some nuances there um, that just need to be worked out. And then, um, uh, you know, in the in the request for proposal, we mentioned interviews, but interviews really weren't part of the review criteria. And if you're going to use those to select a developer or any respondent to a, a, a proposal, you have to have comparative criteria. So we're really that was never meant to be that. So we need to move, remove that. Um, the town's legal counsel looked at it and had a few small changes um, in terms of format. Uh, I think I mentioned the big one was a letter of intent uh, couldn't be used because. Um, well, they said it couldn't be, I think it, you know, they said it could be, it would just have to be um, submitted at the same time as the final proposal. So, you know, at first we're gonna have this two-step submittal process and they said that really is in violation of 30B. So um, at this point, the RFP in my mind is, is really just the, the site visit piece in terms of requiring it to be mandatory and having some certain language around that. Um, so An Anthony said, he told me it would be all set. So I'm, um, you know, I'll, check in with them again tomorrow. Um, if not, honestly, I don't mind running with it. I used to do procurement um, before Anthony came. Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, only because I did block grants and other grants. So I used to do all the procurement for block grants and everything else. So I'm pretty familiar with it. Okay, thanks, Nate. And as long as you're speaking to us, I'll go to the next item, which is the status of evaluation of the strong street property that we're interested in oh sorry can i, ask, can I go back and ask a question sure. I, I mean i'm very relieved nate to hear you say that you could run it because my concern isn't just getting it out but if the procurement officer leaves last time there was trouble with getting questions answered if there isn't even anybody there then what's going to happen with questions getting answered so Right. I guess I want to know that even if it gets out, will there be something in place so that questions and whatever else has to happen is dealt with properly and in a timely manner? Yeah, I mean, I spoke with Rob Moore, the building commissioner, and he said, you know, he could we could use his name or my name. So one of, you know, or both of us could be um, named in the document to, you know, have questions sent to. So then we would be the ones who would, you know, field all the questions, take in the proposals and everything. Um, accounting may may differ on that, right? So the accounting office may want someone in their office to handle it, but 
Rob, you know, so with Rob the other day and he's like, I, I don't, he's like, I can, I don't mind doing it either. So um, we haven't had that conversation yet, but I think it's something, cause I'd like to keep moving it forward as well. Um, yeah. So just delayed. You just want to have it fall off a cliff because of somebody who left. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, it's, you know, Anthony was um, for better or worse, you know, he was the, you know, he was involved in any procurement for the town, whether it's the schools, police, fire, everything. And so I probably have like half a dozen, maybe eight projects right now with him. And so now it's like, do are all of those stalled? Um, it's just, you know, it's unfortunate that that position is relied on so heavily. So, um, but I, I think we can manage the E Street one, just especially because it's, you know, if we were just starting, I would say that might be an issue, but because we've already gone through and the RFP is pretty much done, I feel, I feel pretty good about it. Thank you. And for, so for Strong Street, like John mentioned, you know, there's the, you know, about 12, 13 acres that the town owns. Um, you know, it's essentially a paper subdivision, right back in the early or late 80s, I guess, it was never developed, a few lots were purchased. And so um, I reached out to DPW, they didn't have too much, um, you know, they had some, some helpful ideas. And I did reach out to uh, one firm to get quotes for um, everything from surveying to wetlands to utility assessment. And they said they'd get back to me with an estimate. Um, some of their members were on vacation last week, but I have, you know, I asked for about four things and depending on their responses, then we may have to formulate, you know, a formal request for proposal given the cost of, you know, how much those could be. So, you know, I'm kind of excited to have that move forward a little bit. Okay, great. Um, so that's that's always good news. So hopefully we'll have uh, another property to be in working on um, in another couple of months. We'll, we'll see what the results of the uh, analysis for that property are, but that would sure. be great. And I think you know even before you know even as that's going on, I think you know the trust, Rob. I think you had mentioned you know we talked about it a, a while ago. And there were some ideas about could we sell off some of the lots or who, what's the right amount of development for that site. And I think the trust, you know, that could be another future agenda item. Just, you know, we could, I could send some maps around, do a few things. We could just, you know, um, context maps and other things. We could just talk about what we think is appropriate. Um, you know, we might hear 12 acres and think, wow, that's pretty big. But in reality, given uh, topography and site constraints and its location, I'm not, you know, I don't think it's necessarily the right place for incredibly high density, um, you know, but I, I okay. think it's good to hear the trust too. Thanks, Nate. And uh, I think Kevin mentioned 132 Northampton Road or the Amherst Studio Apartments. So I talked briefly to Laura, I guess a week or two ago. And so I have an update on that since I think she's away right at the moment. Um, as I believe everybody knows, Valley Community Development <clears throat> has received funding from the State Department of Housing and Community Development. So they're set to go ahead. What they're in the process of doing now is developing the final detailed building plans. You may think you've seen those <laughs> because there have already been a number of versions. There was uh, a a rough version that went for the town-wide discussion of whether they should get CPA funding. Then there was a more detailed version that went to the C uh, ZBA. And then there was an even more detailed version that went as part of their proposal to DHCD. And finally, they're in the last iteration of building plans. And once they have those, then they'll go out to bid for a builder find somebody who actually will do the construction. And Laura hopes that the construction will start uh, next spring, uh, spring of 2022. And it probably will take a year or a bit over a year to actually do that construction. So we may have tenants walking in the door by the fall of 2023, which would be great because that's a project we strongly supported and I'm so glad that uh, with all the work, particularly that Valley's put in, they're gonna be able to move forward with the project and they're really on track, as I say, to finish it 
uh, within two years from now, probably. Uh, but like everything else with affordable housing, it just seems to take a lot longer than you think it will. Uh, any other comments? Okay. Um, about two weeks ago now, we received uh, a final report from Jana Tetro of uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley, in which she responded to some questions about who applied for housing and who got housing, looking at racial and demographic characteristics. Are there any questions or comments about that report? Okay, if not, then, then we'll move on. Uh, yeah, we're doing pretty well, I think, on time. We have two major things to talk about at this point. Oh, John, the just, first... quickly, just quickly, I, I will, um, sorry, the, uh, um, on that one, you know, they accepted applications into June. And so we actually just made payments for some households up and up through August. So, you know, what, you know, we didn't, because the program, you know, went to June, um, you know, community action approved a number of tenants. And so then I, you know, we processed payments as the town has in the last two months. So, you know, although, you know, technically the, you know, we we're done looking at applicants a few months ago, we, we did just make payments last week. Um, and then, so that, to me, that's a good thing. Um, the other one is there's still money, you know, the trust voted a certain amount, we didn't spend it all. And, you know, whether or not in a year we see more, um, you know, a need for it again, you know, it's something the trust could, you know, um, could offer or come up with another model for, you know, a, a, you know, emergency assistance. And I don't know yet, but we are getting reimbursed or a fair amount of the funds were, um, are reimbursable from, uh, because of COVID. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what that means in, in the end, but, you know, a fair amount of the, the money uh, will come back to the trust. So we'll have, you know, funds available for something in the future. Okay, great, thanks, Nate. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the American Rescue Plan Act. That's what ARPA stands for. I kept forgetting what the A stands for, but it's the second A stands for Act. Um, basically, is it, Amer is it? I mean, Amer is it American Rescue Plan Act? Yes, I believe that's right. Yeah. Anybody want to correct me? <laughs> I'm willing to stand corrected, but I think that's correct. Okay, the American Rescue Plan Act was something that Congress passed, uh, I think, early this year. And, uh, uh, oh, okay. So I was going to share your, your email. Right, yeah. Um, and the money is distributed to states. In some cases, it's also distributed to localities. And there's some of it, I think, that the uh, White House or the administration also controls. In any event, Amherst is large enough to have received its own allocation of ARPA funds. I believe that it was going to be $9 million. Uh, and I think that's what I wrote to you. But as I now understand it, it's actually going to be $11 million. I think I ran into the town manager and, or somebody else and told me that it would be $11 million. So it's a significant amount of money to the town. And uh, I think there are many calls for how this money should be spent, or there will be. Um, but I think it's important that some of the money be spent on housing and not just a small amount, but a significant amount. As you all may know, the governor has said that if he has his way, 20% of the state funding would be spent on housing. So there are at least a couple of ideas that came up related to housing um, that I put before you. Um, I also attended a CHAPA event in which there was broad discussion of the ARPA funding and how it might be used. And I included a table that was, uh, uh, produced by uh, Tori Beret of the National Low-Income Housing Coalition uh, that showed examples of 
ways in which these funds are being used. Um, it's still early days to some extent, uh, both here and elsewhere, um, but everywhere people are considering what the best use of these funds are likely to be. Um, because we did this program on uh, climate change, sustainability, and housing, um, one of the things that came up in that was subsidizing the costs of retrofitting rental housing in Amherst. And so that's one idea that I put out. And I've been doing some research on that. Rita's been working with me. And I think that's an interesting opportunity. Um, and I can answer questions about that uh, as we go along. The second idea that's come up, which Kevin mentioned, was potentially purchasing the University Motor Large with ARPA funds. And then I didn't have a third idea. Again, I just put this table in the note that I sent to everybody that had examples from, I think it was four places in the country of how they were proposing to use these funds. Uh, the one thing that I don't think will work, honestly, is uh, just simply asking for a large chunk of ARPA funds to be put into the trust account. It doesn't fit the program as best I understand it for a couple of reasons. One is that the funds all have to be obligated by 20, December of 2024 and then spent by December of 2026. And so if we just have funds sitting there, they have to be used and it would make more sense if we have a specific way of funding them. The other thing is that whatever we propose is gonna go through a town review process. And I think the more specific the proposal uh, and the more we're clear about how one or two ways of spending the funds is going to be helpful, uh, the more likely we'll be successful in having the town adopt that approach. So I'm gonna stop there and ask if there are questions at this point. Uh, oh, I should, I should say there was one other thing I should have said. Um, the town manager has designated Sean Mangano, who's the chief financial officer for the town to be the lead on uh, bringing in proposals for how the funds should be used. And the stage that Sean's at now is he's asked key people in town hall, basically the leaders of various programs, including Nate, uh, but others as well, to come up with uh, statements about how COVID has affected, in our case, housing, as well as what additional problems or effects we might affect, we might expect in the future. And he's asked people to respond in a specific form, which includes a description of what the impact of COVID has been on housing, uh, uh, how we explain it, uh, what the severity of impact is, and the justification for responding to those problem or problems. So that's what we're being asked to do. Sorry for the long preamble. What I hope to do now is to have a kind of general discussion or even a brainstorming about what everybody thinks uh, are housing needs that could or should be addressed by the ARPA funds. And I think it's fine if you have a, a product idea and then we can work backwards and say, you know, what was the impact from COVID that caused this and then, you know, uh, fill out the table. So Sean, you know, that what he's hoping for is to get, you know, this kind of assessment, identification and assessment table that many departments will use. And then from that extrapolate priorities and then try to find out projects. So when we first heard about this, I sent him a dozen project ideas and he said, that's not what I want. <laughs> I said, oh, come on. Does it know what you want? And uh, he really wants this idea of like impact and justification. And um, so I think, you know, I, I end up having to work backwards myself, but if we have, um, so, you know, you can, you know, I think this is a good time as John said, just a brainstorm for anything. It doesn't have to, you don't have to come up with an impact now, but if you have ideas for how you think it could be spent, that's helpful. 
Carol. I, I totally like, <clears throat> John, the idea you came up with about retrofitting uh, rental housing. One thing I wondered about, and I really don't know anything about it, but it seems like a thing that always gets missed is, are there people who are, I know there are people who have trouble paying their rent, are there people who are, are having trouble making their mortgage payments, homeowners or condo owners who are just having trouble staying, continuing to be owners and not ending up getting foreclosed on? And I don't know whether that's a problem, really. It seems hard to imagine that it wouldn't be, but I don't have any evidence. But it's just an area that usually we don't get to because we do, we do the homeless things and we, and we work on the rental things. And so maybe this is an opportunity to do something there, even if I can't say what it is. Or So this is really a brainstorm, right? This is my brainstorm. Yeah, I, I'll answer you to some extent. Um, the statewide program that isn't RAF, but is a companion program called IRMA, is intended exactly to address that. So people who have mortgage problems as a consequence of COMAD can apply in this area to Wayfinders for funds to um, help them deal with their uh, mortgage payment problems. I believe it could include arrears and mortgage payments. So just, you know, just as we talk about rental issues um, or issues for renters, the statewide program is intended to also do the same thing for homeowners. I think, um, John, maybe, uh, sorry to interrupt, but maybe um, to Carol's point, you know, we, um, instead of just focusing on retro en energy retrofits for renters, it could be homeowners, um, you know, block grant money can be used for either or too. And so we don't, run a housing rehab program, but, you know, maybe, maybe it's both, right? It doesn't always have to be focused on landlords, but also on homeowners. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So we could have a, essentially a parallel program or a piece of the program would be for homeowners. Right. So my yeah. thought is the point of the renter program too, is trying to get more money you know, more, more income staying with the tenant, right? And so there's some com complexity with how that could be arranged with the landlord, but, you know, if the homeowner, if we are saving them money, you know, then that money is going to other things uh, that they may need, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree with John. I mean, the idea with the ARPA funds is that, you know, there's, it's addressing an impact from COVID and that the money there's a few years to spend it out, but the pro if we start a program, the idea is that it could it should be sustainable beyond or without the ARPA funding, um, and it could be you know a term limited program. But they kind of want you know they don't necessarily want a town to say develop a whole program and hire staff and then have it be something that couldn't be sustained. So I think the the program that John mentioned as his first idea, we could we can manage it in a way that you know I think it can meet the ARPA funding uh, goals, but, you know, saying like, let's just do something completely new and radical, and then we have to hire staff for it, they, that may not meet, you know, the parameters of funding. Um, just so you know, that's, that's what I've heard. Yeah, this is a program that the ECAC does want to do, and that Stephanie Ciccarello, who's the town sustainability coordinator or officer, uh, is very interested in. And what is the trust thing about purchasing a property though for a permanent shelter or some type of, you know, whether it's transitional housing or sheltering or something? Well, I mean, I think we have to think about immediate needs as well as other needs. And so, I mean, that's the first thing I thought is that there seems to be an immediate need for Amherst. I mean, we have people who are homeless and who need uh, a space the way Kevin talked about and Mary Beth. And Allegra in terms of having a roof over their head and a door that they can close and that leads them to dignity. Um, and so I, I really feel strongly that we need a permanent place here in, in Amherst. I think this group going from religious community to religious community and depending on goodwill is not the way to go. And we've talked about from encampments to permanent space. I'm not sure that we could use ARPA funds to purchase the University Motor Lodge as a shelter. 
I think we'd have to use them to purchase the University of Morrow Lodge as affordable housing. Not that that's a bad alternative, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's what we'd have to do. Uh, it, it would not be purchased as a shelter. And I guess the, uh, the other thing that the working group has kind of been floating is if there are these other identified town properties that were not you know, able to be brought up to snuff for this shelter season, but possibly could with some work be you know, a, a permanent site starting next shelter season, would retrofitting some of the, you know, one of those buildings and maybe having like drop-in space as well as shelter space, would that be something that we could look at as po a possible use for the ARPA funds? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> to answer you honestly, Allegra, it, there, there's a lot of murkiness about what is and is not a legitimate use. And so what you propose may be quite reasonable. And we may find that there are other communities that are choosing to use their ARPA funding in that way. I just don't know. Um, and there's nothing that prevents us from proposing that um, and then see what town hall and eventually town council do with that as well as other proposals. And I think, don't think we're stuck with a single proposal. Uh, you know, I do think, as I said earlier, we should have proposals that are fairly specific that say, you know, here's what we think will be important to solving problems that related to housing that have been affected by COVID-19, even though some of them can be longstanding problems. I mean, when I go back to retrofit and you ask me, what's the problem? Well, again, I can't speak specifically to uh, rental developments in Amherst, but I know in general, there has been discussion about health issues and the health issues relate to the way in which uh, apartments are heated. Um, you know, if they're uh, heated in a way, particularly where it's under the control of the landlord, there's a single heating system um, what that means is the, there's maybe poor ventilation, the apartments are closed up, and particularly of COVID, there's greater risk for health problems. So I think that's one of the values of a retrofit program is we're talking about improving the ventilation of the places where people live. We're talking about also making them more comfortable and also ideally bringing down the price uh, which would help out the tenants as well. Now the Linda's raised her hand. Oh, sure, great. <clears throat> John, um, I, it occurs to me to ask uh, what the other 80% is for. If the, if the governor uh, made a point of saying at least 20% should go for housing. What are we supposing the other 80% is going? Do people whose business ventures or livelihoods were impacted? What are the other kinds of things? I, what, what this is aimed toward is do we have to settle for 20%? You know, could we at least make the case that in Amherst, this would be one of the more pressing issues? Just curious. Uh, I just use the 20% number because the governor did. Um, there's no reason why we're stuck with 20%, you know, why it can't be more. And honestly, I, I don't recall even reading what the governor said the remaining funds should be used for. I, I um, had a sort of specific thought if, um, it, just very broadly, if the other 80% is, to assist where business was badly impacted by COVID, then we should make clear that when we say housing, we mean affordable housing. Uh, a developer with multiple units probably did suffer economically during COVID because the students stayed home. Uh, if, uh, if such a person can make a case 
that some correction would make a difference between their business being viable or not. I don't think that should count as housing. It should count as business. I, I think we want to frame the language that way. I think that's good. I think if we're giving money to developers uh, in, in general, uh, if we can also get some new affordable units out of it, that would be a very good outcome for us. Mm -hmm. So again, to take your example, if uh, rental agents or building owners are coming to the town and saying, we need to be, be made whole because we were only rented up to 50% or whatever it was during the period mm -hmm. of COVID, well, we can say, we'll help you out, but we also want something else back from it. And what that should be in my mind would be additional affordable units. Mm -hmm. I wanna pick up on what Linda said about you know, how much money there actually is available for housing. Um, if, it's, if it's a lot of money, this is an opportunity to really expand a, a home buyer program. You know, we've Amherst Community Land Trust and Valley CDC have, you know, attempted to do it on a small scale, two two units at a time. It seems it seems futile, and and the amount that is needed is so great because the the cost of of housing in Amherst compared to the cost of affordable housing is, is you know the gap is just humongous. So if we could if we could spend a lot of money on on buying down the price of houses so that people can actually buy them and live in Amherst, you know this is a chance to do you know ten or twenty units at once. Yeah, I hear you, Rob, and and you know it it may be feasible. The difficulty is that uh, real estate costs are rising or prices are rising in Amherst right now. And so the cost of buy down may be increasing. Uh, and in any event, you know, we have a relatively short timeline to get this moving. You know, the, the organization that's done the most in a sense in, the, in a buy down program is Valley Community Development. And they have a problem doing more than two or three units in a year or even two years. So while in principle, right, that's, because, like that's because they're spending $50,000 to buy down and that's not enough. You can't, you can't find yeah. enough units to buy down with $50,000. If we can put $150,000 into a unit or 200, then maybe we have that capacity with, with you know, $11 million or $5 million or whatever it is, you know, that it, we could be more aggressive. Yeah, I hear you. So yeah, so Rob, I think, you know, so what I've heard, like, you know, with that program, I think Lucia and I, after the meeting, we can meet and talk about, you know, how we frame the impact, like what's, you know, what's the impact COVID had, and then yeah. figure out how we can make, you know, assistance to home buyers, um, you know, one, one, you know, what, you know, like that, that group is say one row in the chart, and then, you know, um, affordable renters, and you know what's that impact there? And so you know, my thought is after this discussion, we'd have maybe four or five impact categories related to housing. You know, you know, I submitted one for housing, it was just housing in general. But I think, like John said, the more specific we can get to turn, you know, in terms of um, you know whether it's types of households or ownership, renter, you know, whatever we're thinking about. Um, yeah, the homebuyer program is really interesting. I feel like it's a uh, um, it is a difficult uh, thing to break into. And I think we could say there's a reason why with, you know, underemployment and a number of factors why ARPA funding could be eligible for this. I, you know, I don't know enough about ARPA funding to be honest, some of the details. Um, when we received ERA money, the Reinvestment Re Re Recovery Act, um, that's almost, you know, almost 10 years ago, I helped with that and it was, um, there were more strings attached, but it was almost clear <laughs> here, I feel like, we're going to have a lot of ideas and I think it's Sean is going to then have to vet them and figure out, you know, I think that, you know, the town will have to figure out what's eligible, but 
when I read about ARPA funding, um, you know, it's public money, but then they say it's for housing and economic uh, recovery and all these things. And it's not clear that you have to use the money uh, in a public way, right? So it can be given to private entities, which is really, seems really interesting um, without having any strings attached. So um, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know enough. So anyways, I'm assuming if we did a home buyer program, you know, there'd be a, a, a deferred payment or, you know, some write down or something we could have. Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at impacts, um, I believe it's reasonable to say that the problem has arisen because of the pandemic, the cost of housing in Amherst, like many other places where people from cities have retreated, is rising astronomically. Mm -hmm. And that makes it more and more difficult for people who need affordable housing to find something they can buy. So that would be an example of an impact that we could offer at this first stage where Sean's asking for uh, delineation of problems that at the next stage we would say, okay, we can solve that problem by expanding our affordable housing program. Mm -hmm. Linda, you had your hand raised again. I just, uh, just a small follow on to the point that Rob made. It, the, um, we have a pretty good handle actually on what the subsidy has to be in order to assist a family of an income level that can then subsequently be listed on the subsidized housing inventory um, to actually buy a home in Amherst. It's pretty easy to track that. And we're in the midst of a first time home buyer program that we had enough um, subsidy from C uh, CPA funds to fund two families. And the first family very quick off the mark bought the last affordable house in Amherst, literally. Um, they made an offer a little over 250,000. It was accepted. And the second family has made multiple offers now at 265 for homes that are offered in that range and find themselves in a market in which there are 15 offers well above asking price and cash. Uh, so it, it's pretty easy to say pretty precisely what a program like that needs to be able to put on the table in order to support families that can be listed on the affordable housing inventory. In fact, it, it would probably be useful to actually work that out as an algorithm. You could just say, and then it could be tracked every year easily. You know, this, this is the current average market. This is the, this year's uh, AMI. So these are the people that could be listed. This is what they can afford. Pretty easy to figure out what the gap is. Right now, it's about $150,000. And that's to support a household yeah. that's at 30% AMI? No, that's uh, that's at 80% AMI. That's 80% AMI. Yeah, it's, okay. it's not. Oh, yeah. People at 30% AMI can't buy an Amherst. You can't come even close. Because the thing is, you have to consider uh, even even it. Let's let's imagine that one of our donors put enough money on the table to make the purchase price affordable. Such a family would have trouble managing the house, paying the taxes, and all the things that go with that. I know uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity generally pegs their houses at 60% area median income. They're, they're subsidizing, they're doing private fundraising. They're, um, the two houses we built in partnership with, Amer with uh, Habitat, um, they uh, sold those homes for $150,000 each. And they raised, in addition to our having bought the land, they had raised another 50,000 from private sources. The houses cost 200,000 to build. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I mean, it, it, I know what some of the points are that you've made in other, other conversations, John, that it's a lot of money for the town to invest for just one family. It, it really is a question of what, what the, how to frame what the value is to the town of not losing young families. 
I mean, the, the point that you made several years ago, yeah. mm -hmm. 27% drop in school age children during a time when the county only lost 5% of the school age children. That's what that's all about the impossibility of finding a house in Amherst that you can raise, even people with substantial jobs, a two income household, each working at the 40 or $50,000 a year can't buy a market value house in Amherst. And the consequence for Amherst um, is that um, we're simply losing that whole segment of the economy. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I expect we'll see and I will try to update those uh, estimates of the number of uh, households with school-aged children that have, we've lost to Amherst as soon as the 2020 census data becomes available. Erica, you had your hand up. Well, just in terms of impact and um, sort of rationalizing it, what's happened to, to a lot of families is opportunity costs where they had to take their savings and use it for you know, making sure they can make it through COVID. Um, and so I think you know, providing support around mortgage payments does help. Um, I think that it's a real opportunity. Um, I think a lot of people have really been set back by COVID um, and, and they were on a path to possibly home ownership, but at least you know, certainly more stability. So I think there is something to be said around a rationale for supporting that in terms of recovery. That's great. Are there other problems people want to identify that um, we should include in this initial pass to Sean Mangano about things that need to be addressed? Carol? I just want, I, I'm going backwards, I guess, but you seem to say that you didn't think this money could be used to purchase a shelter that was going to help reduce homelessness or at least reduce give homeless people something to do and i i don't know i just look back at my notes from that that same uh presentation and they're very sketchy i will agree but i thought homelessness was a possible a thing that could be uh you know that you could look at the impact on the homelessness situation as one of the impacts you could look at so I guess I just, I, I, I don't want to, and let, maybe you know something I don't, you know lots of things I don't, but uh, <laughs> maybe maybe it's not, I don't want to give that up quite yet, at least without more uh, understanding of it. Okay, I just assumed maybe wrongly that a proposal for affordable housing for people who are homeless, so they don't continue to be homeless or have to live in a congregate shelter would be uh, better received and fit better with this program than a proposal to create uh, a new congregate shelter or to purchase property that would be used as a congregate shelter. But again, that's my opinion. Well, if you, if you can show that one of the impacts of COVID is an incredible rise in homelessness, which I think there's been, then you can say that because of this impact, one of the things we have to do is have this shelter, which is the good kind of shelter that gives people doors in place as a kind of entrance into whatever the process is. I guess I, I can imagine making a case for that. And maybe I'm, there's just, just, yeah, that's all. Okay. Well, again, you make a good point uh, from the point of view of problems, and that is one of the things COVID has done is place many people, many households at risk of eviction. And, you know, we're just starting to see the numbers that have been evicted. So those are problems that need to be addressed. Uh, again, from my personal point of view with more affordable housing. Okay, other thoughts about problems that need to be addressed or ideas that we might eventually push related to the use of ARPA funds? Okay, well, after this discussion or based on this discussion, 
uh, Nate and Lucia are going to work together using the notes to create what is really a supplemental report to Sean Mangano about what the problems and issues are related to housing. And so that's our next step. And once that's in, you can see what Nate submits to Sean. Um, you'll probably be able to see the full list of problems that Sean will have identified by talking to various people in town hall. And then after that, we'll, you know, we'll see how the next step is managed with respect to Sean seeking proposals to address the problems that have been submitted. Uh, I also think at some point there'll be a public process. I don't know whether that occurs before uh, town hall submits a proposal to town council or whether it happens at the point at which a proposal for the use of the ARPA funds is submitted to town council. Do you know, Nate? I no. don't. And I think the public process may involve, um, you know, engage Amherst, you know, an online uh, piece as well as, you know, whether it's meetings through Zoom or something. So if, if I hear anything, I can send out, you know, an email, but I, I, I don't know either. Um, I know they've said there'd be a public process, but I don't, I don't know the details. Um, well, uh, again, it may be early to do this or it may not. Uh, and that is for us to at least take a, an initial vote about what program ideas we think we will eventually propose for the town. The reason I say it looks early because right now they're asking for a problem description on the other hand, you know, we have a meeting in a month, who knows how quickly the process will have moved between now and then. So I think what I wanted us to do is have uh, at least a little bit of discussion about what proposals we think we could support. And then at a later date, maybe we can decide what we, what we would most strongly support given that there may be choices to be made. Erica? Uh, I just have a question about the retrofitting. You know, I, I was at the forum, which was excellent, but I know a couple of um, challenges came up. And so the question is, how would we ensure that these landlords just don't kick people out and, and get higher rents? Uh, and two, the other piece was, how do you work with um, the tenants to ensure that they are optimizing um, those benefits? I think the example was, is that um, somebody kept on opening up windows and it set up the whole internal system whack. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'd like to know more about that before, you know, either saying yay or nay on that. Okay, well, I can kind of answer to some extent both of those questions. Um, most of the work related to this would be done by the Center for Ecotechnology, and they would be using funds that come from the utilities, either Bay State, Gas, or Northeast, uh, no, sorry, Eversource, Northeast is gone. They were taken over by Eversource, okay? And that could cover a high percentage of the costs of retrofitting, 65 to 90%, and maybe 50% of the cost of purchasing new technology. This would be available independent of the ARPA program. It's available now to, building owners who want to pursue this. So where does ARPA come in? Where does the town come in? And the answer is that, as I've suggested, CET does not have the money or cannot find the money to pay for 100% of these costs. So the town comes in and says to a landlord who's interested, we'll pay the difference. So if it's gonna cost you, I don't know, uh, $60,000 per unit, or I shouldn't say it's more like $6,000 per unit to do this. Uh, sorry, the total cost is $10,000 and CET can find 6,000. Then the town can pony up another three or 4,000 to make you whole. 
Now, we wouldn't necessarily want to make them whole for all of the units. Our first priority would be those that are affordable units. So if we take Rolling Green as an example, there are 204 units at Rolling Green, or 205 of which 41 are affordable. So the town would say, okay, you know, you're going to go into this program through CET and we'll give you enough money to make you whole, at least for the 41 affordable units. When we do that, we signed a contract with the building owner. And that contract would call for assuring that the tenants would not see an increase, ideally would see a decrease because the cost of doing this uh, or the result of doing this should mean a decrease in heating or other costs to the building owner. So the tenant should see those. We would want to sign a contract before we give them the money. So that's one answer. The other answer is how do tenants get involved? And that's actually not on your agenda, but I'm inserting an agenda item in a minute that will help to answer that question. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, so I, I, maybe we don't need to have a formal vote because this isn't a final judgment, but are people, for example, um, comfortable with the idea of doing a retrofit program that would be available both to uh, landlords and potentially to homeowners who would income qualify. Okay. Is there anybody who have strong reservations about that at this point? I don't hear anybody. Okay, then the next idea that we talked about is potentially spending a large chunk of funds on buying the University Motor Lodge which would probably be used for affordable housing. I don't know if there's a plan going back to Carol's comment where some of those units could be set aside to be used temporarily as uh, uh, shelter units. So I, my sense is people are com comfortable with that idea. And now I've lost track of other ideas that have come up uh so uh mortgage subsidies mortgage subsidies right for homeowners a very important idea expanding the availability of mortgage subsidies for homeowners and it looks like i see at least rob and carol are in favor of that uh erica clearly okay so it looks like there's support for that as well Again, none of this is final, but it means we're moving in a direction where we've got an idea of what ideas we would support and we can create problem statements for which those would likely be the solutions. Have I missed anything else? Lucia, you're taking notes. Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, okay. Okay, then let's move. Oh, I know. Uh, I, I promised one other item having to do with tenant involvement. Um, the ECAC is doing a proposal. I can't remember to the state agency. It's for about twenty-five dollars or $30,000 to do a first step in organizing tenants to get involved in issues related to uh sustainability but also related to housing it's an idea that came up when they were going through their process of trying to figure out what recommendations to make to the town and stephanie has just completed writing a grant proposal uh for this and nate did you see my note asking you to put that on the screen oh, i sent um, it to yeah. you it's in my email. I was trying to download it. Uh, oh. Just because it was only a, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a single paragraph that I wanted yeah. to share with people. I'm putting, um, it in a Word, I'm putting it in a Word document. Okay. I can also read it while Nate's pulling it together. It's not very long. 
Um, Amherst is in the early stages of developing a rental, oh, there it is, yeah. a rental efficiency standards policy. The town is partnering with CHD Family Outreach to apply for Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and Power Grant funding. The planning grant application seeks funding to organize community members in rental housing across Amherst to engage in the creation and dissemination of a brief housing survey that addresses the building efficiency and conditions of their respective housing. Funding will be utilized to compensate survey participants and to provide a stipend for building captains, tenants who would lead discussions, distribute flyers and serve as advocates for future stages of policy development. Information gathered from the community engagement process will greatly inform the draft rental efficiency standards policy. Uh, I won't go into the draft rental uh, efficiency standards policy. That's something that was discussed in the uh, housing forum that we did on sustainability and housing. Um, but in principle, I certainly think this is a good idea. And I told Stephanie that we would consider whether to send a letter of support that would go in with the grant application for this application. And as I said, I think this significantly responds to the question that you raised, Erica, about how do tenants get involved in all of this? I think if ECAC is successful in getting these funds, it provides a, a path to doing that. <coughs> Questions? Well, um, I guess uh, I'll make a motion that we send a letter supporting this grant application. <coughs> Is there a second? I see a second from Carol. Thank you. And I guess we'll do a, a roll call vote to see who's in favor. Uh, Erica? In favor. Will? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Rob? Yes. Uh, Carol? Yes. And I'm in favor. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have brought it before you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I think we've dispatched that. And we are at our last item, which is also an important item. Um, Okay. Uh, I had hoped Mary Beth might still be hanging out with us, but it doesn't appear that she is. The, the next item has to do with the use of the developable land that's part of the old Hickory Ridge golf course. We've talked about this a little bit in the past, and uh, Rita and I have done a bit more research on this, which I'll describe in, in a minute. Um, the idea would be to propose using that developable land, something like five to eight acres that's on West Pomeroy Lane for a older adult, probably rental housing development. Um, somebody, I think it was Tom Kegelman recommended that I contact uh, uh, Amy Schechtman who is the president of an organization based in the eastern part of the state called Two Life Communities. And they've done a lot of development of these kinds of programs, again, in the eastern part of the state. Nate also mentioned to me that Beacon Communities would be potentially interested in this as well. And so I think we would, would not have difficulty finding developers if we can move forward with this. I'm not quite sure when the town will close on the purchase of Hickory Ridge, but if it happens in the next month or so, um, I think we would be in a strong position 
to recommend this if indeed we are in favor of it. I think there would be interest in town council. I talked directly to uh, <laughs> to George Ryan and to Kathy, Kathy Shane, and they were both interested in this. And I'm guessing that there might be support from other members of town council as well to make this a use of that developable land uh, on West Pomeroy Lane. Uh, let me tell you uh, a little bit about a conversation that uh, Rita and I had with uh, Elizabeth Heyer, or Heyer, who's the Vice President for Real Estate and Innovation at Two Life Communities. Um, so John, just while you're talking, I pulled up, um, you know, Google Earth or you know, Google Maps. Right. So this is, you know, 116 and um, Pomeroy, where the cursor is, and Hickory Ridge is the, you know, the entire golf course. That's 120 acres or so that the town's been trying to purchase, and the developable land. You know, here's the the clubhouse is here in the parking lot, and then Taylor Davis Landscape is here. In between that, along the frontage. Uh, is kind of upland, you know, the river, Fort River goes through the property. So a lot of it does flood, uh, can, can flood quite extensively, but there are, you know, is anywhere from five to nine acres along the street here that could be developed. Um, I don't know, you know, and maybe, you know, some more up around here that could connect to Amherst Office Park, but, you know, the street frontage is really kind of the, the highest uh, part of the property. So since I'm not really that familiar or ha with uh, housing developments for older adults, I, I and uh, you may not be either. So I'm going to report on what I learned, and um, Rita can supplement that with other things that she heard uh, as part of that conversation. Um, basically, Two Life Communities, and I think I sent you all a, uh, a link to their website, uses what's called an aging and community model. It's not assisted living. They don't purport to do assisted living. On the other hand, it is intended to be housing where people can age in and where there will be a lot of supports available although not as much as you would have in a true assisted living development. Um, so it's not skilled nursing, it's not assisted living, but it is housing for older adults, which allows them to age in so they don't have to leave um, if they become uh, more disabled or have any number of difficulties. That's not to say that someone would never leave, but the idea is to um, prevent that. Um, they talk about the major reasons why people leave or have difficulties is um, economic insecurity or loneliness. On the economic insecurity, what they do is they provide affordable housing. Um, if we wanted or the town wanted, they could do a mixed development that included market rate housing, but I think our primary goal would be to have a substantial amount of affordable housing on that site, if not 100% affordable housing. Um, let's see, they would do mostly one bedroom and two bedroom unit. Probably one bedroom would be more than two bedroom. They wouldn't be larger than two bedroom and they wouldn't be studio apartments because in their experience, that's not satisfactory to older adults who may be downsizing, but don't wanna downsize quite that far. Um, in their communities, they try to include at least two kinds of on-site staffing. One is a resident coordinator and the other is an activities coordinator. The resident coordinator um, would help residents to navigate daily life, they would coordinate healthcare services. 
they would do whatever they could to allow services to come into the residence. And so part of the design of the building would be to have locations inside the building where uh, services could come in. And so people could receive services there rather than having to go to another location. Um, they would work to develop agreements with outside agencies, for example, Highland Valley Elder Services, the Amherst Senior Center, in order to arrange for activities that would be physically on site. Uh, one of the things they find is very popular in other developments <clears throat> are fitness services. And that would be one of the kinds of activities that the activities coordinator would try to bring to the site. And there would be other things as well. Their idea about building design is that the first floor would serve as a village hub. That's the language that Ms. Beth Heyer used. Um, and whatever they have might also be available to outsiders to come in. Um, where appropriate. So it's not strictly limited to people who are resident here, but other people could conceivably come in and participate. Um, one of the key parts of the village hub idea is that there'd be a large welcoming entry. And so that would be a place where some activities might take place, but also it would be a space where people could sit comfortably and clearly there should be other kinds of spaces like that uh, perhaps performance spaces a place to show movies uh, a place for clubs or games or whatever all is part of the first floor so there'd be both small and large rooms so that's a general idea about what i heard uh, is important in the development of housing for older adults. Um, the other thing that's significant is we talked to both Lizbeth about this and also another group in Longmeadow or East Longmeadow. And it looks like there's actually financing available that would allow public support for this kind of development um, where it, it, the housing would indeed be affordable. Rita, do you want to add to what I've said? Um, no, I think you pretty much covered it. I think what was interesting to me was to hear that, um, especially to life, Elizabeth used to work at DHCD, which provides uh, tax credits and, and other sources of funding to do affordable housing. And so they've worked with them over the last few years to actually have DHCD uh, revise their design standards so that um, they've, they've moved from a kind of very traditional senior housing model into this type of senior housing model where you have a lot of um, uh, community space which is a, atypical if you look back at, at how um, senior housing used to be funded. So there, there is funding there. Um, they're typically using a combination of a federal program called um, Section 202 and then um, and tax credits. What, you know, we asked Lisbeth because they have, uh, Two Life has a lot of experience now. I think they have something like 1,500 units um, that they, own and, and manage in a number of Eastern Mass communities. And she said, were they to be looking out here, um, responding say to an RFP, if the, the town was putting out an RFP, the trust was doing it um, for a minimum of like 100 to 120 units, just because you need to achieve some economies of scale. So that's a pretty big development. And I think the other um, developers uh, were doing smaller. The, the East Long Meadow group is um, actually does consulting and consults on, on financing. And so um, they were looking more in the 60 unit range. 
So just something to keep in mind. And just to reinforce what, um, what John mentioned is that the only way that um, the, this, these types of units succeed is if you have agreements with um, outside agencies who do a lot of the, the cert, yeah, some, some money built into your operating budget for services, say for the service coordinator and for the recreation, but the actual service provision, visiting nurse or um, homemaking services, those kinds of things actually come from uh, agencies that the developer um, has agreements with to provide those services on site. So that's also another reason why having uh, you know, more units rather than fewer units to create some efficiencies. If somebody's, you know, if an agency is coming in, they'd rather have, you know, be helping a lot of people in one place. Um, so I think, you know, it was, it was encouraging to see that this is working really well. Elizabeth also um, said anybody who wanted to, they'd be happy to give, you know, tours of their some of their properties. I think they're doing something at Devon's if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, maybe that was the closest um, place. They're taking over an existing development at Devon's and converting it to this model. So I think that's the one that's closest to, um, to Amherst, uh, but there's, they have stuff um, again around Newton then up in the North shore. Um, so she was very, very anxious to, um, to help us if they can. So questions or comments? I was just gonna say, um, in looking at their website, a lot of them look like they're very closer to larger urban areas, except for if they're out in mm -hmm. Devons, that's not very large and very urban. <laughs> um, but, you know, I would assume that some of the outside agencies would be transportation agencies because out um, where Pomeroy Lane is, is just one bus that doesn't mm -hmm. go that often. Um, so I assume that that's built in as part of the model. Yes. And they don't provide it. Like they don't build it into their operating budget. As you know, where as some places, assisted livings typically have their own van, that sort of thing. But that's, they don't have it. Other comments or questions? Yeah, I mean, John, I think the, um, you know, we've been fortunate as a trust to uh, get priority for town owned land for housing, but there is a disposition policy that was adopted. And so I don't know. And then, you know, there's been um, discussions that Hickory Ridge would go through a public process. So, you know, I think we can have ideas ready, but I'm not sure, you know, if the trust would have, you know, the first. Uh, kind of first shot at it. I think there's probably going to be a number of competing needs for um, or you know ideas for Hickory. So I think this is a good one. Um, the 120 units kind of scares me a little bit, Rita, in terms of the number of units. But um, you know, I will say that the housing production plan looked just um, east of here on this. We call it the Slobody property. It's just north of um, or behind the uh, Valley Transporter building. And they, you know, they put 45 units in there in a concept design with uh, kind of like cottage style, two and a half story um, homes with multiple multiple buildings, and it looked really nice. And so my thought is, you know, you could probably do two of those pretty easily on Hickory and get 90 units, you know, without having it be too tall or massive. It's just, you know, would would a developer be willing to come out and do that many building envelopes? You know, two live community, I feel felt like was really urban. And so, um, you know, and then I think of like Applewood or, you know, a number of different places around here, but they're usually just one big building, one big building envelope. And so to me, the character or context of West Pomeroy, it isn't, doesn't support something like that. So I, you know, you know, if, if, depending on what kind of prescriptive design guidelines we'd have, I feel like, you know, would they be willing to come out if, if we said we don't want one big building that's six stories? Um, you know, I asked about that, Nate, yeah. and she yeah. said they didn't imagine or she didn't imagine uh, the building that they would propose being any larger than three stories. 
So I was a little surprised, as I'm sure you are, because how do you <laughs> get that many units on that size property? But again, she said, oh, for us, that's a big piece of property. You know, we don't generally have an opportunity to have five to eight acres in the area where we right, uh, right. typically do development. So maybe they have a good idea about how it would be used efficiently, um, you know, without looking too out of place. Yeah, I mean, that would be a huge number of units uh, to be able to provide. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it doesn't have to be the exact two life community right, right. model. So there are other adaptations. Yeah, because I mean, they also you... do a lot of private fundraising, um, two life does to um, enhance their programs. Well, uh, part of this discussion should be. <clears throat> Is there another way you think we should promote the use of the developable land on Hickory Ridge other than older adult housing? I mean, I've kind of fastened on it, but that doesn't mean that as a group we have to go with it. You know, if you think it would be better to do some other kind of housing there or some mixed housing, then that is also something we could pose to the town and town council. I, I was wondering how we started with this particular, I mean, I just was wondering how we got to this. So it's, it's nice to hear that this is something you thought of, but we could think of, we could think of something else. Not that I have in my pocket, something else to think of exactly, but maybe to go back to wondering about home ownership in some kind of way and wondering if there's a way to make some kind of at least condo project. Uh, as a way, as a way to perhaps, I don't even know what that would be like, uh, afford an affordable condominium project. Well, so I'd like instead to, of just being I've... a rental, you actually have some, it's like a condo. So you, yeah. I don't know. No, I, I agree, Carol. That's what I'd like to see on Strong Street, because it's not near public transportation. And so I think that would be a good location for a home ownership project, because people wouldn't be very low income. They might be lower income or modest income, which means, you know, if they were on Strong Street or off Strong Street, they'd probably need a car to get to work or to do errands or do other things. And so, I, you know, when I think about the stuff and I don't expect everybody to agree or think of it the same way, I say, okay, you know, we just did an SRO project or, help to foster an SRO project in town. Um, we're working on a project that is primarily for families on East Street and Belchertown Road that's rental. I'd like to see a home ownership project on Strong Street. And then I sort of said to myself, well, maybe we should do a project focused on older adults as well. And the place to do that would be Hickory Ridge. So it's not like, you know, I didn't think about other kinds of groups that needed to be served. Uh, it's just my thinking is, okay, we're trying to put projects in the pipeline that will serve other groups. Maybe we should have a project for older adults. Okay, thanks. I, I, I like that idea. It's, it is um, housing for older adults has been mentioned for a long time in Amherst. It comes up often in housing plans and, and, and general planning, but there, there's never a proposal. There's never, there's never like, let's do it here. It's always like, it's something we should do. And so I, 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 I like this idea. Seems like the right place for it. So it looks like there's a demand for it because that would have been my question was the demand for affordable housing for older adults here out in Amherst. Um, and that's that place and space. I mean, I, I, I often think more center because it's, everything's more accessible, but it might be very peaceful out there if there was transportation. Um, but there was also a concept, and I don't know if it was Wisconsin or Michigan, 
and sort of an intergenerational mixed focus. And I know that's probably very controversial because sometimes older adults and sometimes younger adults don't want to mix with each other. <laughs> but there are those models where they were actually helping each other out where younger families had older yeah, adults yeah. stepping in and you know then also stepping in to help older adults where their families weren't even nearby or on a different coast i know that's more challenging but i mean i think you know intergenerational support is so critical um and i think you know younger children often are not exposed to older people and older people could benefit as well as the younger children in terms of helping each other. And if you're a single parent or even two parents who are struggling to raise children, having an intergenerational support, elder support is also important. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, Erica, but from what Rita and I learned from talking particularly to the financing group in East Long Meadow is that people who finance these projects don't agree with you. Um, <laughs> It looks like if you want money uh, it, and depend on the source of the money, it either has to be exclusively for people 55 and older or people 62 and older. Uh, did I hear that correctly, Rita? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh -huh. <laughs> un unfortunately, uh, you know, that, that means we can't do the kind of mixed development you were talking about despite the value that it could very well have. So John, one thing my thought is if we are going, without having necessarily a priority in terms of housing type or population to be served on Hickory Ridge, I think, you know, if you talk to Paul or anyone, I think, you know, one thing I'm hearing is that the types of housing we want there can't be zoned or can't, wouldn't be allowed in the zoning that's there. And so, either it's going to have to be another comprehensive permit or we could recommend at right now at this stage as the housing trust that the current zoning is doesn't provide enough density uh you know or the mix of housing types that you know we've discussed and so maybe the first thought is that you know we need to rezone um rezone the you know portions of the property that could be developed you know, whether, and, and maybe that, maybe some of the zoning that would be down there isn't even sufficient. It just, it seems it would maybe, and maybe a 40B is fine. It just seems strange that to get any of these ideas we're talking about it would have to be a 40B project currently. And maybe that's the only way it would have to go because whatever we zone there couldn't be flexible enough to make some of these things work. But it's just, you know, if we have an opportunity to, promote something, it could be a zone change just to, you know, make it easier, but. Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> um, that would be something that we'd have to convince the planning board of. Right. Um, and again, I'm not opposed to taking a shot at that. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Right. You know, even if we did you know, I looked at Verdian Village, you know, Beacon Communities had proposed Verdian Village at Hampshire College, you know, uh, a number of years ago. And I think that was, I, I, I think it was, it was over 100 units as well, but it was on, you know, 50 acres and, but it was larger, you know, they're, they're actually pretty large units. But, um, but the idea of having, you know, two to three story buildings that are, you know, a number of different building types to get you know a number of units like that you know I mean I, I like Carol's idea of having I mean I was when she when Carol when you were speaking I almost thought of like co-housing it's almost like if this site could be a planned unit residential development occurred um, that allows some flexibility in terms of how the units and sites configured um, but you know I don't I don't know what you know what you know who would you know what exactly the end result would be but just the, right now the you know. If you look across the street, the zoning is like, you know, every one home on half an acre or something, right? I mean, that's like, if you just mimicked what's in the neighborhood, you would get six homes along the front of the property, um, right? Or maybe 10, I don't know, 10 or right, but it wouldn't be this other mix of housing we're talking about. So I just think that, you know, I think that some of the residents might be shocked if we're thinking, oh, let's try to get 60 units there we'd have to really describe how it could fit in in terms of site planning and design, even if there is a need for that type of housing in Amherst. 
um, you know, I think there'd be some concern about what it would look like. Wherever we go, that's going to be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I certainly agree. Well, I, I mean, I personally obviously would like to see um, the developable land in on Hickory Ridge go for affordable housing. And I, I think there'll be some support for that on town council. And so my inclination is to try to get our interest in as quickly as possible um, so that people start to think, oh yeah, that's where the housing trust wants to do A or B or whatever it is that we can settle on. Um, Cause I think the sooner we get in and again, it's like with ARPA, the more specifically we can describe um, what we hope would be there. And I don't mean you have to describe a full development, but you know, enough information so people have a sense that uh, that's something they would like to see. So that, you know, this isn't just a technical uh, exercise, it's a political exercise as well. And we need support from the community and from town council in order to move something like this ahead. Um, which of course reminds me of one other thing. Um, I, everyone I believe knows that on Thursday, September 2nd at 4 p.m., Amherst Neighbors is sponsoring a forum uh, which will focus primarily on housing for older adults. As part of that forum, I will do a general summary of what's happening with uh, uh, affordable housing in town, but then we're gonna move toward talking more about housing for older adults and uh, other people who will be speaking will be uh, Donna Hancock, who serves as the nutrition coordinator for Highland Valley Elder Services, which means she runs the luncheon program at the Bank Center, um, which is either meals people can pick up or meals that are delivered now, since people are no longer coming to the Bank Center to eat together. Uh, Donna also lives in Amherst Housing Authority building and she just talks to people all the time. So she's very aware of what's available and what the shortcomings are. And she's gonna talk about that. Jerry Weiss will talk a bit about uh, the need for housing for older adults who are not housed or homeless. And uh, I will talk about envisioning a new project in Amherst, as I've talked to you this evening about, um, that would provide affordable housing for older adults. And then Mary Beth will be there and she'll kind of act as a discussant to talk about what she's heard and what she thinks the needs are based on her experiences as at that point, the former director of the Amherst Senior Center. But she's agreed to do that, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, the one thing I don't have for that event is a moderator. If anybody is available at 4 p.m. on Thursday, September 2nd, and would like to serve as a moderator, I can probably offer you that. Uh, if not, I'll continue to search for somebody to do that between now and September 2nd. Okay, I think that is, and we're, we're we're about 10 after nine, so I'm 10 minutes over time. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate uh, this meeting. We've had a very good meeting. And uh, I think I would urge all of you to continue to think about what we should be doing or promoting for Hickory Ridge. And if you're not familiar with the site, um, you should go by. It's on West Pomeroy Lane. You can drive into the parking lot of the old clubhouse and you can see where the golf course was because in fact, it still is there. If you go on a very rainy day, you can see why it's no longer going to be there because there'll be large ponds on the area. Most of it will become conservation land, 
which means it will be a very pretty place for people to live. Okay, I'll wrap up with that. Any other last minute comments or thoughts? Is there anybody um, who's not part of the panel who's participating, Nate, that has their hand up? I don't see any hands up right now. Okay, well, then I think we're probably ready to adjourn. I won't do a formal roll call. All those in favor of adjourning, just say aye. Aye. Sounds like it's unanimous. <laughs> aye. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, allowing the meeting to go a bit longer. I appreciate everybody's